My name is Carrie Cardinelli with MEA. Delighted to have you here. And thank you for coming in from all over the world. I see so many familiar faces and lots of folks I'm seeing here for the first time. We love to think about these fireside chats as a virtual fireside chat where we're all sitting together in a big circle and getting to hear a really wonderful conversation that you get to contribute to. So we invite you to hop into the chat right now and let us know where you are in the world and what are you excited about for today's conversation? Pop that in the chat. We tend to have many, many countries represented in these live events from all over the world. I see our friend Senbei's here from Japan. Uh, so enjoy that geographical waterfall that's flowing through here to see where everybody's coming from and some of the things that you are most excited about. How many of you are here for your very first time? Wave at the camera. This is your first live event thing you've ever done. Welcome. Ooh. Welcome. Great. I'm going to get myself on the spotlight here so you can see me and um, welcome. We love putting these events together. We love bringing really interesting conversations together. Near the end of this time, like in the last half or so, you will have a chance to ask questions and potentially to come on stage here with Chip and Joanne. So don't be shy. Be thinking about your questions. You can put your questions in the chat at any time. But when Chip says, raise your hand, do it. Push the button, raise your hand and jump right in and get in the queue because we will then be able to hear from you personally. So let me bring up Chip Conley. So happy to have you here. Chip is currently teaching in Baja at MEA and took some time out to be here with all of us today. Thank you, Chip. Yes, I'm excited. Uh, as I've got Joanne's book right here. And as I'll talk about it, I this this I think Joanne and I were separated at birth <laughs> because we have a lot of common interests. And I think this book's phenomenal. So I'm excited for this conversation. And so if you don't already know, I'm sure most of you already do, Joanne Lippman, thank you for being here with us today. She is the best-selling author of Next, The Power of Reinvention in Life and Work, and the number one bestseller of That's What She Said. I love that book. Uh, she is a pioneering journalist, has served as editor-in-chief of USA Today, USA Today Network, Condé Nast Portfolio, and the Wall Street Journal's Weekend Journal, uh, leading all those organizations to six Pulitzer Prizes. Wow. She's a frequent speaker and television commentator, on-air contributor at CS, uh, CNBC, and a journalism lecturer at Yale. Thank you so much for being here with us today, taking some time out of your summer. And uh, as we were saying in the back end, so much of what you are interested in, what you're writing about, is exactly what we're interested in. So I'm going to let Chip kick it off uh, with your conversation. Sure. Thank you. Joanne, welcome. Thank you, Chip. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you, everybody who's who's on with us today. I'm really excited to have today's conversation. You're coming to us from the Hudson Valley, um, right. and and you're a New Yorker uh, in terms yeah. of in terms of where you spend most of your time. You've had such a storied career, um, and Carrie just uh, covered a lot of it. Tell us what you're most proud of in your career, and and also maybe one of your biggest lessons. Yeah, sure. Um, well, first of all, what I'm most proud of in life is my children, got to get that out of the way first and foremost. Uh, but in terms of my career, you know, one of the things that, that I discovered early on in my journalism career, and I started my career as an intern at the Wall Street Journal and then spent 22 years there. Mm. Um, and one of the things that I really discovered was how exciting it is and gratifying it is to, to really find what I would call the white space, to, to find the kinds of topics and the ways to communicate with an audience that others ha perhaps haven't thought of, but that are the kind of thing that when a reader reads it, they say, I didn't realize I needed this, but wow, yes, mm. this is exactly what I wanted. Mm. Um, and so I guess what I would be most proud of would be the things that I was able to create uh, uh, throughout my career from Weekend Journal at the Wall Street Journal uh, to Condé Nast Portfolio Magazine um, to my books. Um, that's what she said to me was, was uh, revelatory just personally because it was a way for me as someone who grew up largely in a male dominated industry, particularly those years uh, as a business journalist, where I was very often the only woman in the room. Um, and I realized I was surrounded by, and particularly in my workplace, surrounded by like really, really fantastic guys. My mentors were all men. And yet I would go to these women's leadership conferences and it was all women talking about the issues that 
were of concern to us. And I realized at some point that women talking to each other, it's an awesome conversation. It's like a warm bath. But at the end of the day, it's half a conversation. And what I realized is we can only solve half of those, you know, we can come to half a solution. We really need men to join us. And I, so I wrote, uh, that's what she said, in order to invite men into that conversation. So those are the kinds of things. And then particularly now with Next, my new book, Next, The Power of Reinvention in Life and Work, um, which was revelatory to me in the research that I did um, and really helped put a lot of things in my own life in perspective and hopefully is helping others as well. Mm. Wow. That's all. Thank you. Um, tell just tell us if you have a lesson, if there's, if there's a key lesson beyond, beyond all of that, do you think, especially around tell, uh, um, that's what she said, what would be the key lesson to be learned from, from that book? Because it, it became a New York Times bestseller. Uh, it, it, it's, it clearly tapped into something in the zeitgeist. What's the lesson? Yeah. So the biggest lessons I think from across my career have been that you really need to have an open mind mm -hmm. about where life may take you. It can take you to very unexpected places. Um, and I think that, you know, the, the, in terms of that's what she said, the, in terms of that open mind, you know, first of all was I wanted to push against this idea that, um, you know, that women have to solve this issue by ourselves and that it's sort of, it set us up as an us against them kind mm. of situation. And I, you know, for me, having that open mind was just that realization that, um, that there are so many men who want to be part of this process, who want to mm. help um, to, to join in and want to be allies. It's just, they weren't being invited in or weren't being, you know, didn't have access to the information, um, that, that women already had. So I, I do think it being an open, having an open mind also in terms of reinvention, which is all about next. And we'll talk about that, but one of the huge lessons was so many of the people who I profiled and I talked to hundreds of people and so many of the people I profiled ended up in a very different place than they had initially planned and yet a much more fulfilling place. Mm. Yeah, so, so in, in many ways, that book was very much about how, how do you bridge the gap of genders? And then next is sort of the bridging the gap of, of generations. And I, I, what I just wanna, I wanna make a note here because when I read the first chapter of your book, um, I have never read a book a book's first chapter that was so aligned with MEA, uh, including my own books. <laughs> um, you quote William Bridges, who wrote Transitions, Herminia Ibarra, uh, who I just, I love her work. Uh, she wrote a book called Working Identity. Catherine May's book, Wintering, about just sort of like, how do you use a slumber or a retreat as an opportunity to refresh? Um, you mentioned MEA, one of MEA's faculty members, Bruce Feiler, who wrote Life is in the Transitions. You mentioned Sarah Blakely, one of our MEA alumni members, the uh, founder of Spanx. You talk about Joseph Campbell, Arnold Van Genev. I have a feeling you do all of that in the first, well, you do it in the book. I have a feeling you do that all, that all in the first chapter. So what led you to writing this book? Um, and how much of it's your own personal story in terms of your own process of transition and reinvention? Yeah. So, you know, the reason why I quote all of those people and all of that, those writings in right at the start is because we know that reinvention is sort of an age old theme. But what was I was particularly interested in was looking at reinvention in all of its forms. Right. So not just in terms of career. And there's lots about career in next. But I also wanted to investigate reinvention in terms of coming back from failure. Or, or if you've survived a terrible trauma and, and you need to kind of reinvent yourself afterward. Um, people who have had life-changing aha moments and, and even people who helped to either reinvent products that were failing or companies that actually needed to be completely reinvented. And I was wondering if 
you know, is there a common theme there? And then what I did is I dug into the research behind it. So I spoke to hundreds of people who had been involved in all these different transitions. Then I looked at the academic research that underlined, there's a whole bunch of new research that looks at the process of change. And I wanted to kind of put it all together. So I did all of this reporting. And uh, and then I basically was like, I had tons of information and I sort of sketched it out on a piece of paper. And what I realized is, everybody was using different terminology to discuss sort of the process that they went through, but they were all talking about exactly the same thing. It's these four steps that pretty much everyone goes through, the reinvention roadmap, which we'll talk about. But in terms of my own personal story, which you were asking about, this really did come from a personal aha moment of my own, um, which was at the beginning of the, of the pandemic. If you recall, you know, back in dark days of March of 2020, when knowledge workers, that includes myself and my family members, were everybody sent home. And at the beginning, I recall, if you can put yourself back in that mindset, we all thought it was going to be like a week or two, right? Like, I remember I actually had a speaking event on March 31st of 2020. I'm like, oh, no problem. I'll make it, Right. And of course, within a few weeks, we realized that the world was shut down. We don't know how long this will last. We don't know what the world is going to look like. And I actually woke up in the middle of the night with this aha moment in April of 2020, saying to myself, this is not just my family. This is global. We don't know what the new normal is going to look like. There's no guidebook to get us there. And I set out to write that guidebook to help us understand how do you get through major transitions? Yeah. How do you get to your own new normal? And I will tell you, I actually, I got up that morning, I wrote an email to my publisher and they were like, yeah, like we all need this. And, and I've been working on it ever since. Mm, thank you. It's a gift to the world. Um, and we'll, we'll get into some of the methodology in a couple of minutes, but I, uh, first of all, <laughs> I love the fact you, you've, uh, You've used the word aha a lot. We we call it down here in Baja, um, where we have uh, our first MEA campus. Our second one will open early next year in with a 2,600 acre regenerative horse ranch in outside of Santa Fe, New Mexico. But here in Baja, we call it the Baja aha. <laughs> we are a midwife, Perfect. midwife for midlife epiphanies for people who are really reimagining themselves. And uh, Mary Catherine Bateson used the term uh, a midlife atrium. And, and that's what we really are. We're a place where people come to help them reimagine and repurpose themselves. And, and if, for those who feel like, oh, I'm not in midlife, well, many sociologists now consider midlife 35 to 75. And my book that's coming out in January called Learning to Love Midlife, 12 Reasons Why Life Gets Better with Age, um, is all about helping people realize that midlife actually is more of a stage of life, life than an age of life. It's a time of massive transition. That is so true. That yeah. is so true. And by the way, in Next, I, I dive very deeply into both aha moments. I have a chapter specifically on that, as well as on gut feeling, because mm -hmm. both of those issues are highly underrated. And of the people I met who had successfully transitioned or successfully reinvented themselves or products or lives, um, those two things really played an important role. And it goes mm. right back to what I was talking about earlier about you have to be open to these things. Mm. Tell us about James Patterson and maybe even Chris Donovan, uh, but at least James Patterson for sure, because people are very familiar with his prolific uh, uh, career as an author, but he had to find his next. Yes, yes. Okay, so James Patterson, I first met more than 30 years ago, I am dating myself. I was a young Wall Street Journal reporter. I was covering the advertising business. I was covering, I was writing about the Burger King account because of the Burger Wars, if anybody here remembers the Burger Wars. Um, and where's the, where's, was that, where's the beef? Where's the beef? Um, well, no. that, that was Wendy's. Burger Wars was, okay. yeah. <laughs> that, was that was like also a political thing. That was 1984 presidential <laughs> campaign, but I'm sorry to interrupt. Go it ahead. was, it was um, you know, are you hungry for a, for, for a Burger King now kind of thing. Okay. Okay. But, um, but in any case, the Burger Wars. So I had to go and interview the guy who ran the Burger King account at J. Walter Thompson. And I walk in and it's James Patterson. He was an ad executive. And I remember because I vividly because it was very early. I am not a morning person. It was very early and I'm dragging my feet. And he says to me, oh, well, I've been up for hours already because I get up every morning at dawn 
because what I really want to be is a novelist. And I'm thinking to myself, like, yeah, sure. Like you and everybody else, right? <laughs> and he's like, no, I got a book published. And he hands me this book. And um, I stuck it in my bag, you know, took out my reporter's notebook. I'm like interviewing him about Burger King. And a few weeks later, I took that book out of my bag. I was on a flight someplace and I started reading it. I do, don't remember the details, but I did recently dig up the Kirkus review of that book. And the first two words of that Kirkus review of that book were abysmally dumb. <laughs> the last two words of that review were deserves drama. Oops, I think we lost her. <laughs> so I went back to James Patterson and um, and he was so gracious with his time. I said, walk me through from back then to where you are today. And he did. And he walked through sort of the, he went through all of the steps of this reinvention roadmap that we're talking about where, you know, he was the, the, the four steps, I should say, search, struggle, stop, solution. And in that first step where you're searching, he was literally, he wanted to write, but he didn't really know how he had no in. He started just sort of writing. He had some early books that like were not doing so well, but he got to that, to the second stage is a struggle, which we're going to talk about because it is the most important part. Um, and this struggle was he started to get his books published and he stayed at the ad agency and he, he, felt like even as his books got better, actually, after the book that he gave to me, he continued to write, this books got better and better and they started selling. And, but even so he was in this struggle. Like, he's like, I don't know if I, if I'm good enough, can I really make it as an author? And then he reached this third stage, which is the stop, which is the moment that he realized he actually can tell you the moment was he was coming back on a Sunday night from the beach in the summer stuck in traffic, absolutely dead stop. And he said, I'm looking on the other side of the road and the cars are going by. And he says, they're going whoosh, whoosh toward the beach. And he said to himself, I am on the wrong side of the road. And that was his stop moment. And he literally went back to New York and quit his job. Um, so he went through this entire process, but it took him many years. He was almost 50 years old by the time that he quit the ad agency to become a full-time writer. What was fascinating about James Patterson is that when I talked to other people who, who were not such vaunted, you know, fancy rich people, um, they, you know, regular folks like us, they went through the same process. So, you know, one of my favorites is a guy named Chris Donovan, who was a telephone repairman for many years um, in Boston. And, he and when you say telephone repairman, do you mean the, the kind who actually go up on the telephone poles or the he kind did not of go, the, the, oh, okay. the pole guy? He worked with the pole guys. Got it, he did got not it. climb the poles, but he was a guy who was doing like electronics and fixing things. Um, but he, they, they were his colleagues, the pole, the pole people. Um, and, uh, and, but so he, he's a telephone repairman for many, many years. He has this secret hobby that he never shares with anybody, um, which is he, he creates these elaborate designs that he sketches out of women's shoes. And he's a telephone repair guy. He grew up in a, in a very working class family where you get a job, you don't have a career. So this is something he does not share with anyone else. And after several decades of this hobby on the side, um, he met his now husband, who he finally showed his pictures to. And the guy says to him, his husband says, you know what, you actually have talent, like actual talent. And like James Patterson, he's like, this is something that I'm passionate about, that I have talent for, but I'm struggling. Like, can I quit my job? I can't, like, I need this, I need the money, right? I need a job. And, um, and for him, the moment came when he was, again, 50 years old, where he was um, diagnosed with prostate cancer, which luckily he I, was successfully treated, luckily. Uh, but it was that moment where he said, life's too short. You know, this is what I just, I was put on this earth to design shoes. And um, his husband actually gave him, they'd been saving up money to renovate the kitchen. His husband gave him the money and said, go back to school. And he did. And today he is a couture women's shoe designer. Boston Magazine named him best new designer. They called him fashion's newest rising superstar. And he was 62 years old. 
And I love that. Love that story. I love the guy too. He's an amazing guy. Oh my God. So I, I relate to that story so much as a gay man who just had his prostate taken out a month ago, who's 62 years old. So I, thank you. I, James Patterson is so good health. Thank you. Yes. I'm, 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 I'm getting better every day. Um, James Patterson, how many books has James Patterson sold by the way? Oh my gosh. Well, he's written or co-written hundred, hundreds of books, but he, he, I believe holds the Guinness book of world records for the most number one New York times bestsellers, something like a hundred plus. So these, it's so interesting to see, hear these stories about people in midlife and mid midlife or even later in midlife. Um, and so let's go back to your four stages again, because, you know, we've got a lot of people on the call here, many of them MEA alums, some of them MEA curious um, who <laughs> are who are going to come down to Baja or maybe to Santa Fe or maybe take one of our online courses. Um, we have a, a course starting this uh, September, if I'm not mistaken, uh, called uh, Reframing. I'm sorry, called it's called Living and Working on Purpose. But we also today are launching a Reframing Retirement course. Um, uh -huh. It'll actually be coming out in late August. So what? Are, tell us about these four stages. This the four stages are really helpful for people to sort of say, oh, which stage am I in right now? Yes. And and so give it, give us a little more detail. Sure, sure. So I call this the reinvention roadmap. And uh, the four stages are search, struggle, stop, solution. So just to go through them briefly. So search, that first stage is when you're collecting information, you're collecting experiences. What's so fascinating about this particular stage is that very often people who are in it don't realize it or or it's unintentional right that you are collecting information so it could be something that's a hobby or a random interest or a side hustle but for so many of the people i spoke with it wasn't anything that they realized would ultimately take them to transition them to the next place so the second stage then is the struggle okay the struggle is the one we don't like to talk about because it's kind of miserable it is, it's when you're disconnecting from your previous identity or work, but you haven't quite figured out where you're going from there. So that's where, you know, James Patterson, Chris Donovan, this is where they found themselves for a period of years, actually. So this, this struggle, it, what's, we don't talk about it when we're telling stories about great transformations. I mean, if you think about it, like Mark Zuckerberg, he goes from college kid to tech billionaire, boom. And, and we leave this out and yet, and yet everybody goes through it and you feel like when you're in this stage that you're standing still. But what my research found is that this stage is actually the most productive and important and you're actually moving forward, even though it doesn't feel like you are. That leads to the third stage, which is the stop. Now, almost everybody I spoke to went through some sort of stop phase. So the stop could be, something that pulls you out of your routine. And that could be something that you bring on yourself, right? Like I quit my job, but it could also be something imposed on you. Like I lost my job or a global pandemic, right? Something that pulls you out of your routine. And what that does is it allows you to have that perspective that you need to sort of synthesize all of these experiences, the struggle, it all synthesizes, all comes together. And then that comes together as final, your fourth stage, the solution, which is whatever you are transitioning to. So, uh... So let's, uh, I want to actually ask you, uh, uh, this is a, a, stump, a stumping question. So there's, the, that's the four stages. And then there's this other idea of the, what we call the anatomy of a transition. And, and Bruce Feiler talks about it, which is the ending of something, the messy middle, and the, and the beginning of something new. Mm -hmm. does, it, does that fit that profile as well? It's also sort of uh, uh, jo um, Joseph Campbell's Hero's Journey sort of has that, that flavor as well. Does it, does it fit the same profile? It's very sim. It, it is. It, it's very similar. It's also similar, though, to what scientists have found. It's. It's. I. Uh, you know. They. They. They're. Um, the stop piece of it is something that you don't generally see in those other iterations, mm -hmm. but it is something that has come out in the science and in the research and in all of my personal conversations and interviews with people. Um, and what the the. When you look at what was fascinating to me is when you look at the science, the neuroscience of creativity, creative problem solving, it goes through the same steps. So um, for instance, and this has been shown in a lab, but it was first 
identified about a hundred years ago by an ad guy, actually, um, that to come up with a novel new idea, you focus on the problem. That's like your search, right? You're focused on a problem, trying to solve a, some sort of creative solution and you're banging your head against the wall. And, you know, then you go through the struggle where you just can't get the answer. You can't figure it out. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you step away, you distract yourself. That's your stop, right? You have to step away. And then only then do you get that aha moment, that creative solution, Um, which, by the way, is the reason, the biological reason why you also have those great insights in the shower or when you're running or when you're doing anything but work. And there's a lot of research behind this that's looked at people who have had breakthroughs at work. And when when in fact, when both writers and physicists, left brain and right brain people were asked to keep diaries of when did they have their best ideas. And then when scientists then um, examined their diaries and looked at what they were doing when they had their best ideas, almost nobody had their great ideas while they were in the middle of work. Almost everybody reported, you know, and they weren't doing anything glamorous, They, but they were taking a break. They were like, I was vacuuming. I was in the shower. I was asleep. Right. And I was running. I was commuting anything but work. So yeah, so there's a similarity there that leads you to that sort of creative thinking. Yeah, for any ME alums who want to add in the chat, if you had a Baha Aha, if there was some kind of epiphany that you had while you were here in Baha, um, maybe write just a, a paragraph about it in the chat because it is we, it is interesting how changing your habitat and your habits can actually shift your your brain and how your brain is, uh, the firepower of your brain, the, how the synapses are, synapses are firing. So, well, in a few minutes, in about five minutes, we're going to open it up for questions, and maybe we'll have some questions from people who can say, I'm stuck in the stop stage, or I'm stuck in the struggle stage, and you know, what are some suggestions you might have? And, and so uh, those of you who are interested in asking questions, feel free to raise your hand by going down to the reactions function and at the bottom of the screen and um, and raise your hand that way. Um, and also Chip, could I yeah. mention one other thing? Yes. Which is that, uh, you know, when, uh, apropos of your last question about sort of where does this fit in in the panoply of, of sort of history and, mm-hmm. and psychology and literature, where which it does, but there were two big myths that um, I really exploded in this book. And th- there's a lot of conventional wisdom out there that is just wrong. And, and mm-hmm. one is, I want to mention two. So one is what I call the Cinderella myth. And that mm-hmm. is what I was referring to before, this idea that is so damaging that we somehow think that all of these sort of transitions or breakthroughs, they have to be instant and abrupt, mm-hmm. right? And mm-hmm. this is from childhood. It's it's just drummed into us, you know, Cinderella, and then you're an adolescent and it's Superman and Spider-Man. Now as a grown-up, you turn on the TV and it's who wants to be a millionaire or American Idol. And it's so damaging because it makes you feel that if you're struggling, that you are the only one and it makes you feel like there's something wrong with you. And there's not, there's nothing wrong with you. We all go through it. It's so important to understand that. Um, and that that myth is so damaging. So I want to just just like explode that for everybody here. The second myth, and this is particularly true in the business literature, is that you have to know exactly where you're going and then work backwards and you have to have every step of the way to get there. So um, think about like Think and Grow Rich, which is the seminal text, a perennial bestseller, um, which basically lays out you have to have every step of the way. And, and by the way, that's a that is good advice if you know you want to be a surgeon you better take every step and you better take your mcats and you better go to med school fine but for so many of the people i interviewed they and en- they ended up in places that they had no idea where they were going and and i think that's part of this idea you have to be open to these things like for example one of my favorite guys who i interviewed um is a guy named will brown who spent 30 years, he's a Harvard trained economist, spent 30 years at JP Morgan in London and New York City. And today he is a cattle farmer in the Hudson Valley, not far from here. And um, I asked him like, how in the world did you get from one place to the other? And, And he said, first thing he said is, I did not set out to be a cattle farmer. That was not in the playbook. Um, but he, as he described it, it was a very organic, it was extremely organic it, because he had bought a farm 
as a weekend home, kind of a broken down farm. Over the course of years, decades, he, he kind of got drawn into farming. And at some point he owned, you know, bought some cattle and, and he thought it wouldn't, you know, like how hard can that be? <laughs> He's like, they just eat grass. And then he realized like, this is a growing business. And he, he ultimately came to that stop moment where he had to make a decision because, you know, he had two essentially full-time jobs that were very different. And was it city life or farm life? Kind of like Green Acres and uh, farm life one. And, and, but he said like, he uses everything that he learned, all of his experience as an economist, he pours into being a cattle farmer. It's a small business. He has to know about supply chains. He has to know about budgeting. He has to know about marketing. Like all of these issues all play into his current roles, even we, though it's very different. We call that same seed, different soil. Yes. Different. So, uh, which was my experience at Airbnb. I, I was a boutique hotelier for 24 years. Uh, loved it till I hated it, and then you know sold my business at the bottom of the Great Recession. Uh, and a couple years later, I was asked by the founders of Airbnb to come and be their modern elder, what they called someone who's as curious as they are wise. And um, I realized that I was in the tech company at 52, and I was twice the age of the average person there. And I felt really out of place. I was an intern more than a mentor, and I so I coined the term mentor, and I was a mentor. Um, and I had to, what I realized is that much of what I learned in the bricks and mortar boutique hotel business was very relevant to Airbnb, even though it was a tech company, partly because it was in the hospitality business, but partly because a lot of what I'd learned was about humans. I, I think one of the things we really miss in current culture is we think that knowledge is the end all be all of being successful and happy in life. And the truth is all of the world's knowledge is on this little device in my pocket, the little magic stone. Um, and in the era of AI, you know, knowledge is, you know, at our fingertips in the most interesting ways, but what we really need is wisdom. Yes. Wis wisdom is what's scarce. Wisdom is, is a, I define it as metabolized experience, our life lessons, metabolized experience, which leads to distilled compassion. How do you, sh wisdom as Jeff Hunley, one of uh, my co-founders at MEA says, wisdom is not taught, it's shared. So how do you share your experiences in a way where it feels compassionate to the person receiving it and distilled in that customized way is like, oh my God, you just delivered a gift to me that felt like it was just perfect for me. Does that Absolutely. make sense Absolutely. And, and it's also, it's so true that, you know, with all of the people who I, who I spoke to, even those who seem to have these incredibly extreme pivots, um, they all would say very much what you're talking about. And, and everybody would also say nothing was wasted. And I think that's really important because so often when people, particularly in a struggle stage, they're like, I'm wasting my time. Like mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm chasing the wrong goal. I'm wasting my time. You're not wasting your time. Like mm -hmm. you will find that everything that you have experienced and all the wisdom and knowledge that you have gained is something that is going to lead to your next pivot and that you're going to be using. So I think all of those less lessons and all that wisdom you accumulate is so important. Mm. So um, in a moment, we're going to go to questions, but we have no hands up yet. So I know there's a lot. Oh, there's a hand. Um, let's get some hands up because I know some of you, as <laughs> I've said in past online chats, do not wait till the last five minutes and then complain to me that you didn't have, we didn't have time for you. This is the time for you to consider. Um, and Here's a really provocative question for those of you who are curious. Joanne, in your book, I learned that Plato and Viagra have something in common, which is so, which is a very weird thing for me to read after having my <laughs> prostate taken out. But I mean, I'm not, I'm not even going to go there. That is a bad joke. But um, tell us what Plato and Viagra have in common. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So this was fascinating to me. So. In the book, one of the chapters I have is actually on something called post-traumatic growth, which is hugely, hugely important. It's a relatively new field that looks at, we all know about PTSD. After you have a trauma, you may have post-traumatic stress. Um, but post-traumatic growth is these researchers, psychologists have found that very often you also will have some sort of growth, like you appreciate life more, or you're willing to try new things, or you have a different perspective and it's growth. And what the psychologists tell you, and this is getting back to Plato, is that um, if for the trauma survivor, 
it, the key is to have what they call an expert companion. An expert companion is somebody who can reflect back to you your strengths, where your progress, et cetera, because we are not very good at having an objective view of ourselves, but they have an objective view of you. My, um, in, 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 in next, what I argue is we all need an expert companion and the expert companion, because we all have these innate strengths that are so second nature to us that we don't even realize they exist. And your expert companion can help get you focused and give you the perspective that you don't have yourself. I also argue that companies need an expert companion. And this is where Plato and Viagra come in, um, which is both of them were dying products, both Plato and so Plato, few people know this, actually started life as a household cleaner. It was called Kutal wallpaper dough. And it was back in the old days in the 30s, 40s, 50s, people had coal stoves. And to get the soot off your walls, they sold this wallpaper dough. And by the time you got to the mid 50s, nobody had coal stoves anymore. And the company was on the verge of bankruptcy. It was a family owned company, it supported the whole family, and they were all about to go bust. And then the expert companion showed up and it was the owner's sister-in-law. She was a nursery school teacher. And she called him up one day and she said, uh, I just bought some of your kutal and I used it to make little um, ornaments as, as modeling clay. I used it as modeling clay for my students. And it was like that huge aha moment. And because of her, the, the boss listened to her. He flew out, he looked at her her um, designs that she had done. And he realized like we can reinvent this entire company, which they did. It was amazing because all they had to do was take the, they took the cleaning agent out of it and they put the scent that we all know so well into it. And, but they used everything else was the same. It was, it was wallpaper dough. They used the same cans. They just put a new label on it. Um, so, so that was one example. And the similar example was actually Viagra. So Viagra started life as a heart drug for angina. And it was a terrible angina drug. It just wasn't working. And generally what happens is in a case like that, it happens all the time that the product just dies, right? The drug, they just like chuck it in the garbage bin and that's, you're done. In this case, the scientists who were overseeing this in the, and in the early testing were very far away from headquarters. They were in Sandwich, England. And so they had very little supervision. And so they had the, the impetus, they had the, the independence that they said, you know something, we tested it, it was not good for angina, but there was this really weird side effect among the men that they were saying they were getting erections. And so they sort of under the radar started testing it as an impotence drug. And um, they had to, they fought a lot of headwinds because people were like inside the company who heard about it were like, yeah, we don't do sex drugs here, you know? Um, but because they were able to do this, they were able to figure out and they did this testing that it was an incredibly powerful new class of drugs. Importantly, as with Plato, when the CEO caught wind of it, he was like, he didn't say shut them down, they're renegades. He said, this is amazing. Let's double down and let's invest in this. And, and so in both cases, the sister-in-law and the chemists who are all far away, they've served as expert companions. And the important thing is that the boss of, of the company listened to them. And it just, it's so important in the workplace for your, you know, bosses to have respect the employees and customers and, um, but to, to really listen, right? To not sort of do the top down, but to listen what's bubbling up. Beautiful, beautiful. Well, let's see what's bubbling up in our audience here. Uh, Ginger, what question do you have for Joanne? Hi, um, thanks. Thanks, Chip, I pre appreciate that. And Joanne for such a great, informative talk. Um, one of the things that caught me when you were talking about the two big myths that are damaging, um, I'm wondering how, how you, I see those as two barriers to remove. Um, can you speak to any other possible barrier, you know, how to remove barriers to entrepreneurship specifically for midlife or elders? Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you, Ginger. Um, I think the biggest barrier, honestly, is fear, right? It's they're, 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 the ones that kept coming up again and again in my conversations. One was fear of leaving something that is certain for something that is uncertain. Um, 
And the second one has to do with self-identity. So in terms of the first one, in terms of the fear, I think that one of the one of the really successful strategies that I saw among the people who made major pivots was what I call they moved before they moved. In other words, they didn't just drop everything and then try and pick up something new. They they edged along. Most of the people who had a major transition actually were sort of on their way um, already and had already gotten you know half or two thirds of the way there by the time that they actually made the conscious decision to, to, to go there. You know, the cattle farmer, for example, um, he learned over the course of many weekends, the, the shoe designer um, you know, was already like well on his way with all of his designs and his schooling and his classes. So, so they didn't, it wasn't an abrupt um, change. They move before they move. But the, the self-identity piece I think is really important. And by the way, this, this applies more to men than it does to women, though it applies to all of us. We all have a tendency to equate our self-worth with our jobs and our identity with our title. And that really prevents people from moving on. Um, and that's one thing that um, that we really have to work hard to kind of overcome. Um, women, the reason that that women are a little better at this is because Men really solely are tied to their job title. Women are much more likely to tie into alternate identities. And I saw this, I ran a magazine that after the financial crisis, um, the magazine closed. And in that day when we were closed and we brought out all the liquor, because if you're in a newsroom, you always have liquor, but we brought out, like everybody's drinking and, and everybody's gathered around and the, the men were all like, oh my God, I need another job. The women who were all, um, the top women were all the major breadwinners in their homes. But they, even so, were saying things like, I'm going to spend more time with my kids. I'm going to take off the summer and like spend time with my ailing mother who, you know, lives in another state. Or I'm going to spend more time on like getting my physical health belt back in order. Uh, and it was really interesting to see in real time um, and, and, but you do have to make a conscious effort to, to, to deal with that. And, and I should, I should add one thing. I was just talking, I was at a college reunion talking to a very, very close college friend who just retired from being a doctor all these years. And he said, who am I? Like, he said, I'm in the midst of this identity crisis. I said, you're still a doctor. Like, just because you don't draw a paycheck any longer, it doesn't change who you are. And I think we have to get over that. Mm. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you. Valerie, nice to see you. Thank you so much. And this has been such an amazing conversation. So I really appreciate the insight that you shared so far, Joanne. And my question is, 56-year-old woman, no children. I am absolutely loving midlife right about now. <laughs> How do you shift your brain, shift your thinking, not to be so concerned about what close friends and family think about your decisions? True, you know, I love my mom. My mom and I are very close. Sometimes she may not agree with things I want to do. Um, and I'm in, you know, I'm right now I'm in a position where I can. I'm being considered for a job, but at a lesser title than what I used to have. So my friends are saying, oh, no, you shouldn't take that job. You worked hard to get to this level, blah, blah, blah. I can really care less about titles at this stage of my life. Um, I'm about being in the position and being in the space of service. So how do you just kind of like shift your brain not to be so concerned about what others think, especially your loved ones and your family and friends? <laughs> So first of all, I love everything you said, Valerie. Absolutely love it. Um, so um, one piece of advice generally, though you are getting advice from friends and family, but but um, I got a great piece of advice recently. I was doing a panel on, on life changes and somebody on it said, um, don't worry about what everybody else thinks about you because they're not thinking about you, <laughs> which I thought was pretty great. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but in terms of what you're doing, I love what, the way you're thinking about this. I have a chapter in Next that actually specifically looks at, I call it necessity entrepreneurs. And this is women, people of color, people in the LGBTQ community, people who very often are actually pushed off of regular career, mainstream career trajectories for various reasons. But one of the things that I found for women in particular, and there's research on this, 
if you look at the um, the women's careers, right, they go through a, a set of stages. There's an academic who studies this at Bowling Green State University. And the stages she mentions roughly correlate to the stages that I was talking about with, re with the reinvention roadmap. For her, the final stage for women, she actually calls it reinvention. And the reason is she said, almost all women will end up reinventing their careers at some point in their life for some reason. But what she said is when they do reinvent their careers, it is almost always mission driven, service driven, mm -hmm. just like what you're talking about. And mm -hmm. once you understand that, you see it everywhere. And I salute you because I think that is it's it's so important and and you know we see that with women sort of in every kind of sphere of life and um and I think there's nothing more noble or or wonderful than exactly what you're thinking about doing. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks Valerie. Before we go to Myra, um I want to just ask a question from the the chat which is um how do you seek out an expert companion? Oh, yes. Okay. So you can seek one out and you can also be one, right? The, don't, I mean, you're, you are probably somebody else's expert companion. Um, and generally it's not like, uh, it, it's not like, like the children's book, are you my mother, right? It's not, it's not, will you be my mentor? It's generally somebody already knows you pretty well. So in some cases it is a career coach or a professional coach or, or a therapist, but in most of the cases, in most of the many of the people I spoke with, um, it really turned out to be a close friend, sometimes a family member. Um, in my own case, it was actually my husband. Um, there was a moment, I, as I mentioned, I spent 22 years at the Wall Street Journal. I loved my career. I was on a very great trajectory there. Um, and then I was approached about moving about going to Condé Nast to, to start this business magazine. And it was a really, really difficult decision. And I stressed over this for months, months, and I was just literally paralyzed. And then one day, my husband actually said, he didn't give me advice. He didn't tell me what to do, but he reflected back to me what he was seeing. And what he said to me was, when I see you talk about your current job, I know you love your current job. But when I see you talk about this mythical non-existent magazine that you might be able to create. He said, your entire affect changes. He said, your face lights up. He said, you don't see this, but I see just this entire change in how, you know, in, in, in the excitement level in how you're emanating um, um, excitement when, when you talk about this non-existent magazine. And it was, to me, that was my aha moment. It was like, he was the one, he wasn't saying, go do this. He was simply saying, let me reflect back to you what I see. And it made me realize, yeah, I really do want to take this incredibly risky move to try something new. Um, yeah. and that was how I made my decision. So that, that expert companion can be that person for you. A, a, a quick aside, we have um, a private workshop down here. So every, basically every week of the year, we have a program here in Baja. This week we have, you wouldn't see it on our website because it's a private group of, um, it's a group called Silicon Guild, um, a uh, best-selling, bunch of best-selling authors, uh, Joanne. Um, uh, and yesterday, one of the authors said to another author who had, they'd never met before, you are my enlightened witness. You are, in essence, you are my expert companion. You are the person after we leave here that I'm going to be relying upon. And I see this all the time uh, with MEA workshops where someone leaves and says, like, that's the person who gets me, understands me, like, and so we're going to, we're going to stay together and, and often do it in a, in a reciprocal relationship. Myra has been to MEA and um, are you in Portland right now, Myra? I am. Is it hot up there? It's gorgeous in 62 right now. Oh, beautiful. Gosh. Uh, what's your question? So as you know, Chip, I came to MEA during a big transition in career mm -hmm. and I lost myself and who was I? And I really found uh, some great teachings there. And now I'm going through a relationship reset and it's huge. And I'm looking at your four steps, Joanne. And I'm reflecting on what Valerie said as well, because what my co-parent and I decided is not to divorce, but to have this new family structure where we're together, but not together. And we date others and we, we you know, we're together. So it's, it's a funny kind of loose framework and nobody 
but three people maybe supports it. They think it's mm. it's very risky. They think it's really weird. I'm looking at your fourth steps. And my question really is, um, how do you know? I mean, do, do they sequential? Because I feel like I'm moving through all of them almost weekly and then coming back. And how do you, I don't know, have, have you done any research and applying it to like relationship shifts like that? Yeah. So Myra, thank you so much. That's a really, really great question. And and first of all, just in terms of the sequential nature, a hundred percent, these are steps that you can go, you might go through them sequentially and that's common, but very often it's like two steps forward, one step back. You can, you, you can go, you know, you will almost certainly go through these steps more than once in your life. And, uh, but very often you'll also see that you might go th through them in a some, somewhat different order. Um, so for example, people who have had a great trauma, I mean, the trauma is what, what starts them on this path. And that is essentially what we would call the stop step. That is actually what, what is the, the first step for them. Yes. So, um, yeah, absolutely. And yeah, the people who I interviewed in the book, um, they went through very, you know, not exactly your situation, but a lot of these personal situations where you had to reset. And, you know, it's very similar. I think that um, um, it is really important to, I, I hear this a lot, like other people say it's wrong. I really do feel like following your gut mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. something that is so important. I did a lot of, I did a very deep dive in next into this whole gut feeling. Cause one of the biggest questions I had starting out is how do you know when it's time to jump? How do you know when it's time to transition? Mm -hmm. And what I found is that, um, that this following your gut is, is we tend to discount it and you shouldn't, you shouldn't. I mean, there's, there's actually, there's a lot of scientific research that underlies this, but also just a lot of the personal stories I heard from people who um, who talked about how everybody said this was the wrong thing to do, but I felt it was the right thing to do. And, mm -hmm. and uh, you will almost never regret doing, going, feel, feeling that your gut is correct. Thank Beautiful. you. So we have four people with hands up. We're going to do this uh, sort of lightning round. So we're going to start with Grace Ann. Grace Ann, um, if you can actually encapsulate a question in two or three sentences, uh, and then okay. we'll... And Joanne, if you on these ones, let's go. We'll just brief responses. Yep. My question for you is what can organizations, whether they're profit, nonprofit, do to support people in any kind of transition? Yes, thank you. Okay. So I don't have time to answer this in at length, but I have an entire chapter actually on what organizations should be doing. But really, a lot of what it boils down to is trusting your employees and listening to your employees, uh, which is something that doesn't happen enough. Um, and I know we're short on time, but I do I, I actually dive into that in in quite a bit of detail. Beautiful. All right. One more reason to buy the book. Let's go to Hope. Hi, Joanne and Chip. Thank you so much for this conversation. Um, any quick tips around the struggle? Um, yeah. I've been in that place many times in my life, but just anything quick that can help when it feels like I'm treading water, but I'm really not. Yes, yes. Okay, so in next, I actually have a dozen strategies that I, that I tease okay. out in the back of the book. Um, that help you get through all of the stages. Um, but definitely, you know, understanding, uh, first of all, just understanding the fact that the struggle you are moving forward is important. Um, the expert companion is important. The, um, oh, one of the, one of my favorite strategies, honestly, is reach out to weak and dormant ties. That would be people who you only know tangentially or people who you've lost touch with. And when you do that, um, you know, very often it rekindles ideas. It helps refresh your thinking. Um, but also what the, the best advice I could give to everybody to do this, actually something you can do right now today is reach out to one of those weak or dormant ties to say, thank you. Reach out to somebody who's helped you in the past. That will, first of all, make their day, their year, you know, they're, they, it, it's the most amazing thing you can do for another person. It will make you feel amazing. And then it rekindles as an ancillary point, rekindles that relationship and then can help you also as you try and move forward. Mm, Thanks, Joanne. That's great. Jack. Hello. Um, 
one of the things I struggle with is that as we get older, our values shift from more ego driven uh, things to more existential things. And I've found it hard to goal set and vision, uh, future vision, when you're not really looking to check things off the to do list, you're looking for meaning and purpose. I wonder if you could speak to, to how to set goals in that frame. Yeah, absolutely. So, so, you know, one of the things is to start doing, not just thinking. So if it's even something that you're even remotely thinking about, um, to go ahead and do something, you know, take a course, shadow somebody, volunteer. Um, also, you know, there's a, there's a psychological phrase that, that I think is very cool called um, possible selves, which is imagining mm -hmm. how you might be, what you could be. And uh, that is very powerful as a first step in thinking about it, it, it is you're thinking about different options. Uh, but the real key to possible selves is once you imagine it, think about what it feels like, what what might it take to do that? You have to then take action on it. Um, and I think, you know, the, the the worst thing we can do is kind of sit and cogitate. And the best thing we can do is say, OK, I'm having this little glimpse of a thought or this idea. Go out, take action. Jack, we have a workshop next week on finding your soul journey here in Baja. So if you want to come on down, and, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I am co-leading it. Just know it starts on Monday. Um, I got I to gotta run out by domestic corporate first. Yeah, so. domestic corporate, <laughs> check out the website. Uh, so very good. Thank uh, you. Uh, we're going to get to Sembe after Lisa. Lisa. Hello, thank you, Chip and Joanne, so much. This has been really exciting to listen to. I'm wondering if you have any tips on ways we can reframe and even normalize this process of reinvention within our own circles so that we can not only um, live it out a little bit more, but actually become leaders and examples for others that we work, live, play with. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Lisa. So, so this is actually one of the core reasons why I wrote Next is to give us that framework. Um, interestingly, you know, the book's been out now for two months and I, what I have found is a lot of it is a lot of what I'm hearing back from are like executive coaches and per personal coaches who are using it as a framework because it is the kind of thing, the reason I put it out there in the world is because I'm hoping that we can, we can spread this framework around so that we can normalize. I really want to normalize this idea that particularly of the struggle and the stop and especially the struggle. I can't even tell you the response I'm getting from people who are just saying like, thank you for saying it out loud, right? Because it's something so many of us struggle with personally and privately and only within the confines of our own home or our own, our own minds. And I want to normalize this so that we all realize that this is part of a process and that it's normal and it's actually healthy. It doesn't feel great, but it's healthy. Life is liminal. That is three important words to define it. Sembe is calling from Japan. Sembe is an MEA alum, both online, but he also flew all the way from Japan to Baja for a workshop. Sembe, Amazing. Briefly. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for today. I'm very happy to be here. here. And uh, it is very interested in the fourth stage you mean. Uh, and uh, just felt what I felt. Uh, just tell you what I felt. And uh, the stop stage uh, doesn't uh, meaning of the quit things. Mm. Doesn't and mean quit thought, thing. It doesn't mean to quit. Yes. Not quit things. I think, uh, I thought th this stage was the, the stopping and the thinking for a moment. Mm. And I thought it was a time to review or reconsider and then remember my life and then the prepare for the next solution stage. And uh, so transition starts with end. So ending struggle will be the trigger for transition equals a solution, I think. So. Thank you. It thank is you, good, right or not? So. Thank you. Yeah, I think actually you're making a wonderful point. And, and this is one of the reasons why the pandemic actually was sort of a global stop stage for all of us. And it and it was a time out, regardless of whether you're a frontline worker or you're someone who were sent home, pulls you out of your routine. And it was, I think this is the reason why we have seen so much change since then. You know, we had the great resignation and quiet quitting. And now we have, you know, we have a lot of 
struggle right now as people are trying to, to reprioritize their lives and rethink what really matters to me. And we see that all over. And that's because we did have that time out and it wasn't, it wasn't a nanosecond. It, it's been a period now of years where we've had time to reflect on our life choices and reflect on what is important to us and reflect on what are our priorities. Mm, beautiful. Thank you. Thank much. you. So Joanne, thank you so much. Um, we, that was a lot packed into one hour. Great questions from our MEA community. Really appreciate that. Uh, Carrie, there was a question in the chat about when the reframing regener uh, retirement uh, course is online course is coming up. When is that? Yeah. So thank you all for coming. You will get a recording sent to you via email. You can see the recording on our YouTube channel. We do have a reframing retirement course in Baja uh, at the end of January, and we have a new online course that will be launching at the end of August. All that can be found on our website. Thank you, Joanne. I think everyone is excited to get your book and dive in if they haven't already. Thank you, Chip. Amazing conversation. Thank all of you for raising your hands and posting in the chat and making us feel like we were all together uh, being expert companions for one another. Have a wonderful rest of your day and thank you all so much. Uh, uh, two you. things. Number one, Joanne, we're going to get you as a faculty member at some point. That I hope I hope you're open to that. Absolutely. Uh, and secondly, someone asked about when are we opening Santa Fe, the ranch campus? It'll be in March of next year. So keep an eye out for that. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Thanks, Carrie. Thanks Thank for you, having everyone. Me.